Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I know we have some folks joining us uh, from all over the world today, uh, from as far away as India, South Africa, and Asia Pacific. Uh, so thanks all of you for joining us uh, and for joining us on uh, our fifth uh, webinar of this year. And today we're going to focus on uh, a really a key topic that we hear a lot about with our customers uh, and prospects, which is standalone selling price. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the concept and the importance of standalone selling price uh, and show you some great um, intellectual property and methodologies that our team of experts has uh, developed here at Bramasol. Just a quick reminder, as always, the webinar is being recorded as long as well as all the webinars that we do. So you can go check out oh, almost 100 webinars I think we've done uh, so far on various topics such as revenue accounting, treasury, uh, the solutions economy, uh, and many others. So I encourage you to go check those out, share them with your colleagues. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the session. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, we'll answer your question or I'll try and get to those questions. Uh, and if we don't, we will follow up with you afterwards. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, you can download previous webinars from our homepage. We'd love to have you contact us, reach out, engage with us on these topics. Again, you can check out all of our content here on bramasol.com or Facebook. Um, join us on LinkedIn. We have several discussion groups going both uh, across a multiple topics, whether it's treasury, uh, revenue recognition, which is what we're talking about today, revenue accounting uh, or leasing, uh, s for hana of course. Uh, you can check out our YouTube channel. We have several dozen videos available for you to, to um, look at, and we'll be putting up a new series of videos that I encourage all of you to look at um, about some short snippets uh, from our wonderful Sarah Thompson. So check those out. And of course, uh, we have uh, several podcasts and broadcasts available to you through Apple iTunes and iHeartRadio. So today I'm just going to dive right in because this is kind of a meaty subject and I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, and I brought this up because we know uh, in the case of revenue recognition that um, the big change here and the big focus here has been the move to the five-step model and moving away from a specific guidance-based uh, activity into more of a, uh, a, a guidance or principles-based activity. And we talk a lot about the five-step model. And we know that the five-step model includes you know, identifying uh, the contract with a customer. And we have some information and talks about that. Things like uh, who is the customer, agent versus principal, what is the, cust is the contract? Um, identifying performance obligations and promises and what is uh, a performance obligation? Uh, transaction prices, uh, and we talk about that. Again, that's another principal versus agent, a lot of different activity there. Uh, and of course, today we're gonna focus heavily on uh, number four, which is the core um, of the real activity that goes on here, both four and five are the real core of the new activity that goes on uh, and focus uh, on step four, which is allocation of the transaction price uh, to the different uh, performance obligations. Uh, and then of course we recognize the revenue. Um, Julio, maybe you can comment for a moment um, of your thoughts on, on step four, and then we'll kind of dive right into the next slide. Yes, hi, good afternoon, John. Um, so from my perspective, I think, as you, as you correctly said, this is one of the most important and critical steps because now you have that allocation methodology that you have to come up with, and especially in the 606 lifestyle, which is basically you have multiple performance obligations, and the critical part is how do you allocate one transaction price to these multiple performance obligations. A simple example, you have a, you have a cell phone and you buy a warranty and you buy Netflix, but you're paying T-Mobile or AT&T $100 a month. So, you know, in the background, us accountants, we really have to figure out what is the right methodology based on certain criteria to allocate that $100 over 
multiple performance obligations. So I think it gets very complicated for some companies, especially companies that have multiple element arrangements and you really have to look at it very closely. So this is one of the webinars that just like you, I'm very excited about because we have some really cool stuff to show. Absolutely. So, you know, Julio, you've done a lot of these and I think, you know, maybe Prasad, you can comment on this as well. Um, you know, why don't you talk about these five most challenging areas that we've done and, and, and you know, to give folks a perspective, most of you know us, um, you know, we've probably done almost a hundred or more different projects ranging from full implementations to uh, assessments to uh, migrations from ECC to s -4 hana these, these five seem to stand out. And maybe, you know, Julio and Prasad, you guys can talk a little bit about each of these. Sure, I'll start off and then go into Prasad. But I think, John, this is a, this is a good continuation of our RevRex series that we've been doing for the past three to four months. Last time we talked about commissions accounting. Previously, we've talked about variable consideration, but this one is going to be standalone selling price. But I think if you look at these five, they really differ in how challenging they can be. And it really depends on what industry the company is in. And secondarily, what system are they using? So when it comes to talking about standalone selling price, it becomes very interesting because it's all about the data and historical data and how you analyze it. But I think a lot of companies also struggle with modifying a contract. So when you have contract modification under 606, you, you, start, you start thinking about, is this a retrospective change where I have to go back from the beginning of the contract and actually modify the contract, or you do it prospectively? And all those steps involve sometimes pretty complex true-ups in the accounting world. Um, and then as far as commissions accounting, we know that uh, FASB changed the way in which commissions are accounted for under 606, so now, you have to link your commissions plan to the way you recognize revenue and recognize the commissions cost in relation to how you recognize the revenue. So all these are what we, you know, we have, you know, based on our project scope, you know, what we have found to be some of the most challenging areas. So happy to be talking about SSP today. Prasad? Yeah, yeah for me, like, thank you, uh, Julio and John. So for me, this the contract modification, like I I have seen, like it all depends upon, you know, the client requirement. Like even though we say that, uh, you know, there are certain fixed rule set and based on that, the contract, uh, this the revenue will be allocated with this, it, whether it's a retrospective or prospective allocation. But in reality, what we have seen is that because a lot of business process also impact on the contract modification and they each client they have their own way or requirements when it comes to contract modification and SAP is pretty flexible also and SAP has provided a number of ways through which you can handle this contract modification. Same way for this the standalone selling price. Okay, so SAP is very flexible on the standalone selling price also and we can use the SAP functionality plus we need to add some of our, you know, uh, some recipes into this, and then we can build this, the standalone SSP calculation engine, and which can be. And, and this is not just limited to only SAP, you know, order management system. We, this is a flexibility also where in we can bring data from some other third party, you know, order management system, something like a, a system like a JD Edwards or some other, also can be integrated here. Yeah, over to you, John. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And and I think it's really important. You know, we look at all of these, um, and we think many of us think in terms of this the the way business is done today. And Julio, you know, mentioned something very interesting about the wireless um, contract in your phone. We think of a lot of companies who are out there who um, you, know, you buy a product and you pay for the service over time. Uh, but what we're seeing, and you, you can check out some of our upcoming uh, information about, is the solutions economy or the move to more things in a consumption-based uh, model. And this is where contract modification, standalone selling price, all of these five elements really come together. Because if you think about that, um, it becomes far more dynamic in this space. When you allow the customer to make their changes and dynamically create their own bundles, 
uh, or you want to come out as one of our customers uh, wants to do, they want to reduce the time it takes to go to market with new offers uh, from you know um, months down to weeks. And in order to do that, you know, you really have to think about what what tools are you using and how are you using those tools, whether it's um, you know, offer development, but you have to look at it from a revenue accounting and all of these different things become considerations for that. So with that in mind, you know, Julio, we've talked about standalone selling price. What the heck is standalone selling price? Yes, John. So we talked about it a little bit before, but it's, it's part of step four in the five step process. And basically it requires companies to allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation in proportion to its standalone selling price. So standalone selling price is really what we used to call in the accounting world um, an arm's length transaction. So it's the price at which the entity would sell a promised good or service individually to a customer. Now we have to be very careful here because you know some people on, in the audience may say, well, what about intercompany pricing? Well, remember, SSP and ASC 606 only deals with external pricing, pricing outside of your company. So it does not include intercompany pricing. That's a whole different topic we can get into another time. Um, mm -hmm. So really, it, it, the core functionality for SSP is the following. It has to be an estimable transaction price that is readily, not readily available. So what does that all that mean? It means that you really have to try to estimate. In my example, I gave the example of a cell phone and I'm paying $100 a month. What would be the price that somebody would be willing to pay at an arm's length transaction for that cell phone? And somehow I, ha I now have to bifurcate the phone, the service, and any ancillary services within that $100 contract price. So it's really trying to say, once I have my performance obligation, what is the standalone selling price that I can get if I were to sell this product individually without a bundle? And I think the most complex part of this conversation is when you go to these, uh, you know, in my example, the AT&T's or the T-Mobile, they tell you, oh, well, if you sign up today, the phone is free. But we all know under 606, there's no more free phones or free items in the bundle. It may appear on the surface as a free item, but we in the background, especially in accounting and OTC processes in any company, they now have the work of saying, I offered it for free, but what is the standalone selling price? I think that's the best analogy I can give, John. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And, and Julio, standalone selling price isn't an SAP term. Standalone selling price, you know, is is a is a like an ASC 606 IFRS term, is it not? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, it's not an SAP. It's not a NetSuite. It's actually a FASB ASC 606 requirement to estimate that price for that bundle or that performance obligation. Right, it's not the SAP selling price, it's the no. standalone selling price. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess in, in a minute, we'll talk about the estimation of it, but I think what you're, what I'm hearing from you and is, you know, as we think of the allocation process, really right. the, the, the lever or the, the, the fulcrum, if you will, of this lever of how you do the allocation really is the standalone selling price of Correct. each of the individual elements. And that drives that allocation. And of course, uh, we'll talk about how, how do you derive that. And, and and people have talked about different ways of fair market value. It used to mm -hmm. be, what is it, the VSOE, mm -hmm, a lot of other right. things. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, John, just, just, just so we talk about the third bullet there, because usually right, right. if you have one product if i have a vehicle i'm selling there's no other elements in that bundle essentially that is the observable selling price however mm -hmm. in most scenarios today especially in your reference to the um the solutions economy basically what you have is you have to determine standalone selling price if the selling price is not readily observable 
So in all these solutions economy, you have multiple elements being sold, but the customer is only paying one price. That is the perfect example of when you have, if the selling price is not readily observable for that one line item. So in, in, in my example, when you go to AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon, and they give you that cell phone, it's not $100, it's not zero price. So therefore, in that scenario, under FASB, that's where the selling price is not readily observable because I'm not paying $100 a month for the cell phone. I'm paying a bunch of different items that for some reason is the selling price is $100, but that's actually not the readily observable selling price. Right. And, and I think what's also interesting, um, Julio, is, you know, you use the car as an interesting example. And as you and I both know from um, work we've been doing with companies like Honda, Toyota, yep. Mazda and others, there's a lot more to that. And um, specifically, you know, you might have a car, an automobile, and I bought a, you know, a, uh, a Toyota Corolla, right? Um, but my Toyota Corolla came with an extended warranty or my Toyota Corolla came with a service contract or my Toyota Corolla, by the way, and this relates to the service economy or the solutions economy came with a subscription, a subscription mm -hmm. to Sirius XM radio uh, right. or to OnStar, which is the GM service stuff. So again, there's a lot of this vagaries, if you will, treating, treating something that seems on its face easy or sure. simple, but when you peel the onion back, maybe not so simple, right? Exactly. Yeah. So talk about that. So, you know, you talked about SSP methodology. Yes. Right? So yes. Ob observation, that's the big thing, right? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, the, the guidance basically says the first thing you have to do is what is your best evidence of the observable price in a company standalone sales for a good or service. So what does that mean? That means that if, so if I went to Walmart and I purchased, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a, a television, there was right. no subscription service, it's $150. That marker on the price is the observable price. Mm -hmm. But in your example, and the minute I, told, I said about the vehicle, I realized I gave a bad example. But if I give the example of the vehicle, and then all of a sudden the vehicle is $35,000, but it includes, to your point, a warranty, Sirius XM. It includes uh, Netflix. Sometimes they got Netflix on TVs now in vehicles, unfortunately. Yeah. unfortunately. So then is that $35,000 for that vehicle the best evidence of the standalone selling price of the vehicle? And the, and the quick answer is obviously not, because somewhere inside of that $35,000, I now have to allocate the Netflix service, the Sirius XM, the, the warranty service. So if I don't have that, 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 that sticker, that MSRP, as we like to call it in retail, then how am I supposed to observe it well as 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 the board says correctly on the screen there you have to estimate it and this is where accounting becomes fun there you go all right so how do we do that <laughs> so yes so there's a methodology that is given by fasb and 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 iasb so you have to do a couple of things you have to use the use of observable inputs. So what, what, what do I mean by that? And I'm sticking with my car example. So if I have my car and I'm selling for $35,000 and it includes a three-year subscription to Sirius XM, I can go to Sirius XM's website and say, okay, if I have a vehicle and I want to buy the service, how much of that service going to cost me at arm's length? It might be in fact, I have Sirius XM. It costs me $19.95 a month. So that is an observable input into that price of $35,000. Does that make sense? Sir? Yep. And then, as good accountants would know, whatever estimation methodology I'm using, I have to use it consistently. 
So mm -hmm. I cannot say um, because I bought a different type of vehicle or a higher model or a lower model, I'm going to change my estimation methodology. One of the foundations of, of accounting 101 is the use of a consistent methodology throughout your estimation process. So that's the key takeaway from that perspective. And then to your point, John, you know, you talked about VSOE, which mm -hmm. is vendor specific observable evidence is essentially the precursor of SSP under 606. So in the old days before ASC 606, we had uh, AS topic 605, which essentially allowed VSOE. And VSOE is what we used to do as the residual methodology, whereas if I have three objects in one pricing transaction, and I know those the, the standalone selling price or, or the observable input to two of those objects, I'm allowed to use transaction price less those two objects equal the remainder. That is what the residual technique actually is. And just as an FYI, as the guidance allows, once you have, you, you will do SSP at contra contract inception. You don't need to update it after unless, you know, some companies, I'm going to talk about that a little later, some companies update SSP on an annual basis, but also guidance says if you need to update it because there's a change in your business model or business process, then you can update it accordingly. But what we've seen in practice is most companies update it annually or some companies do it biannually. Right. But as we see from you know our conversations with some of the telcos, uh, software companies, uh, gaming companies, um, Annual might not be the new what the new normal. It might be quarterly or monthly. So you know something to keep in mind when you say, well, I can do this manually. It's pretty easy, but um, you know. So, all right. So talk about this chart for a moment. Yes. So this this actually comes from the FASB. I always we always like to talk about it because this is a nice uh, pictorial illustration of what to do. So. The first thing we talked about, if you have the observable price, that is always the best evidence. So if I went to Target or Walmart and I'm buying a computer or I'm buying a calculator, or just for the ease of simplicity, I'm buying a box of Kellogg's Corn Flakes for $4.25, that is the MSRP, that is the price that I'm paying for it. There's mm -hmm. no other services involved in buying a box of cereal at Walmart, that is the best evidence. But when you start talking about tablets or computers or cell phones or vehicles, then you start getting into this multiple element arrangement. And essentially, the observable evidence is the price at which an entity would sell in the open market. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I cannot, if I don't have that observable price, in my example of the $35,000 car, I have six different performance obligations within that, mm -hmm. then I have to estimate it. And the FASB gives three possible estimation methodologies. There's what we call the adjusted market assessment approach. There is the expected cost plus margin approach. And then there is the residual approach, which we talked about a little uh, before. So, mm -hmm. John, if I, if I may, I'll just take a couple of minutes to go through each of the approaches sure. because I know that, Please. you know, we're looking at keeping an eye on time. So, yeah. The assessed market assessment approach is where, you know, the approach considers the market in which the goods or services are sold and you estimate the price that a customer would be willing to pay. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means that in this approach, you would essentially look at my market that I operate in. So in my, in, in my vehicle example, um, I would look at for all the cars that are being sold, the type of car, and I would be able to estimate the price. So if you look at it, this kind of information, you would need market data, you would need pricing strategies for other products, you would need competitor information, and you would have to be able to have some type of dynamic pricing strategy. Now, most companies in practice do not have this type of information. But the FASB, again, being flexible, allows this approach. 
The next one is the expected cost plus margin approach. This, I would say, 99 out of 100 times, this is what most companies use because it is something that you can look inward to your company's own data set and get an estimation. So the expected cost plus margin is exactly what, it's, what, it's, what it sounds like. It considers the forecasted cost of fulfilling the performance obligation and adds a margin at the amount at which the market would be willing to pay. This method is most suitable in situations where, one, the demand for the good or service is unknown and information on the demand for similar products is not available, and two, direct fulfillment costs are clearly identifiable. Sure. So this is very popular in um, a lot of the big, uh, the big companies that produce engines, they produce yes. uh, airplanes, Airplane. like, like mm -hmm. the Boeing, the Lockheed Martins of the world, right. where right. you can have, you know exactly what your cost is going to be because you do it, you know, you have a, a cost estimate, but you also know that your margin is going to be this amount. So it's very right. common in these type of uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. The last methodology is the residual approach, which we spoke to um, uh, before which is you can use the residual approach if the entity sells the good or service to multiple customers for a variety of prices and the entity has not established a price for that good or service and has not been sold previously on a standalone basis. So what does that mean? That means that the company first applies other approaches to each standalone selling price within the contract and then applies the remaining percentage uh, for that residual. So again, in my example, I have three performance obligations. I know the arm's length transaction price of two. So therefore, I'm allowed to say transaction price less um, trans uh, SSP of those two equals the residual value of that third item. So in my example of a vehicle, I know the price of the vehicle of $35,000. I'm selling Sirius to $20 a month. I have a warranty of, of $3,000. I'm allowed to take $35,000 less the $20 times three years, less mm -hmm. the $3,000 warranty, boom. There you have my value, the standalone selling price sure. of the vehicle as it stands on its own. Right. And this is particularly, you know, that's a great one, or this is particularly evident in um, some of these companies we've been dealing with recently that do contract manufacturing activities or do custom studies uh, in the pharmaceutical life sciences industries where they haven't really done that thing before and therefore they might have done a piece of it um, but there are aspects which they've never done and they can use the residual approach as a way to to do that since there's really no quote-unquote market-based approach to you know that at that, that that piece right yes correct correct exactly exactly Joe you know, Prasad, you know, you, you're as, as one of the leading uh, practitioners out there, and you've been doing this now with us for 10 plus years. Um, you know, do you see, you see all of these used in many of the projects that you've been on? Absolutely. Yeah. Expected cost plus margin approach, residual approach, all we, I have seen come across many clients using this, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay, Julio. Standard yep. includes estimated approaches? Yep. So we just talked a little talked bit about, about that. Really. Just, just so just to summarize, deep. John, you know, we have three approaches, adjusted market assessment, not 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 really so much um, commonly used, but like as Prasad correctly identified, the most common are the last two, which is expected plus, plus, cost plus margin. And as it says here, this is the preferred, preferred approach because it's the easiest approach. Every customer has their cost of sales, so they know exactly the cost of each product, and then they can add a margin that is that, 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 that they know customers are willing to pay. The residual approach is a direct translation from the VSOE, from ASC 605, so that, especially in tech companies, a lot of tech companies, they sort of transition their VOE, VSOE approach to this residual approach. I mean, it's not recommended by the FASB, but you find that a lot of companies, because they're most comfortable with it, using that residual approach, especially in the tech sector, they've sort of grandfathered that into ASC 606. Yeah, and I think the one thing I would I would highlight, and we'll talk about this when we get to the end here and re remind folks about this is, you know, 
the margin is not the margin that you would like to get. The margin <laughs> is the margin uh, what the the market would be willing to pay, and of course, well, you know the, that that has different implications, and we'll talk about those. Uh, so, um, John, that's a great point. That th yeah. that is a great point because you know just because I sell a product and, I, and my cost is thirty dollars, I can want a hundred percent margin, but am I going to get it? Probably not. So it's a great point. Yeah. Um, key some key quick takeaways here, where you know because uh, yeah. we want to dive into the solution, right? Yes, um, very quickly, just know that SSP is always done at the outset of the contract. Um, you want to make sure that the actual price charge to customers is really represented by one point. As you will see in our demo coming up, you always look at the range. And then the range is, you know, you're going to have various uh, points, prices passing through that range, and that's going to be acceptable. Um, Always look to try to estimate the entire population of the standalone and always looking at when you have judgments outside of the range, you know, we always like to put it back to the customer to say, does this make sense to you? Should we adjust our range? And then once we have the range selected, anything that's coming in within that range usually pass directly and easily through the pricing methodology. All right, thank you. All right, so let's talk about our approach to SSP and, and you can kind of tag team here with uh, Prasad, so. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just kick it off very quickly, John, just to say that most companies we have done projects with, we always hear here of the nightmare of, we have a big access table, we have, a, we, ha we have an Excel spreadsheet that we have a hard time updating, that we have a hard time managing because it takes a lot of data and Every month passes by, you add data you, to your data set, so it takes a long time to manage and run. So mm -hmm. what did Bramasol do? Bramasol came up with a solution where we have our own SSP calculation. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Prasad to explain the methodology. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. So basically what we have come across is like, you know, when we do this, the uh, for the SSP calculation periodically whenever clients want to do this analysis they come across and they see that they have to go through this hundreds of thousands of line items basically the invoice and the line items and they have to group based on the price segment what price segment means here is is basically they need to decide what is my standalone selling price for this particular product and it could be that product they may be selling based on the you know their markets or the regions or based on some other uh, you know categories so it, it's not just a one even if they are selling some let's say the julio gave example of this the television sets or the car they're selling but the market could be different you know the price cannot be the same in the european market and the same as in the u.s market that also in the u.s also depending upon the category there be there some additional categories where the price may varies so depending upon the customer customer this the calculation process uh, changes you know there is no one fixed rule for this and that's what we have come across and and that's the reason we decided to build this the idea of this using this price segment to categorize the standalone mm -hmm. selling price so basically we we can define this the price segment may can be you know my my product group or it can be my you know customer group it can be my region it can be my product hierarchy there are multiple even for the route to market there are multiple parameters here to analyze this you know uh, data so basically based on this we need to define our price segments and we need to analyze this data and that's where this price segment plays very very important role because whenever we are going to apply the standalone selling price we have to keep that in mind that you know based on these rule sets we need to apply standalone selling price kind of. so yeah good job you're saying something no no i know i said that's that's great yep yeah so basically what we have come across is like you know on an average like you know we have seen that anywhere between 300,000 to 500,000 line items you know uh, that's the i'm talking about the medium size uh, you know corporation 
not not multi billion dollar they have huge data so when when go even for to analyze this data and plus there are certain rule sets like if there is an aim if this arrangement okay there are applies to multiple sales order that and all these multiple sales orders comes under the same arrangement then we cannot consider this as a separate you know we have to mm -hmm. filter those and based on that we need to analyze this data so doing this in excel or in some equivalent using some other tool is really time consuming basically and then then uh, what we have come across is the revenue accountants or who is doing this analysis they spend number of days working on this and to decide what is my exact standalone selling price per product group or based on the product yeah mm -hmm. so that's where this uh, the tool which we have built helps you know well, let's yeah. let's dive into that so how does the tool work what's the the flow here yeah so this this is basically we have considered because we have come across many clients they do this their analysis fast uh, 12 months uh, data like you can you can decide like whether you want to do analysis based on the historical data for the past six months or 12 months or more so that like, depends upon each uh, customer's requirement you know and then then the we then the program will identify the tool will pull all the data from the order management system it can be a third party application also but the tool will pull this uh, information from the respective application for analysis purpose and while doing this as i said this system will inside based on the rules we have maintained depending upon customer's requirement eliminates all the credits or partial credits given to the customer or this you know as i said contract arrangement you know based on these rules will identify all the line items invoice items basically and based on that we will be doing analysis so basically this tool internally groups based on price segment this is the data which is pulled basically here i'm talking about the invoices invoice data because a lot of customers they insist upon the pulling this invoice data instead of pulling the sales order because sales order if it is not invoiced and it is just created in the system it is of no use for the analysis purpose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay because that's a future sale so basically we always pull this invoice data and do our analysis here also we segregate this the tool will segregate this the renewal and this new orders again how we want to handle this this is completely flexible and based on that the result system will analyze this so the next is the analyze result and you will see the complete output here and per price segment business user can analyze this what is the range okay let's say my tolerance range is 15% the price which I have calculated and the value which I have derived, whether this falls within the range or outside the range. Now, based on our historical analysis, we can decide our passing rate, saying that, okay, this standalone selling price, which I have, or I will use this word instead of using standalone selling price, fair value percentage, which I have derived here, whether this falls within the range or outside the range. Now, right. we can say that 60% is my passing rate or 70%. This is completely based upon the product, your region on all the parameters and our historical analysis we can decide that whether it's a passing rate is 70 percent or 80 percent or 60 percent right. and then the tool will check this internally and will say that whether the ssp achieved as needed or not if my answer is no it is not okay then sap the sister the tool allows the user to go through you know to do further analyze this the all the line items selected for that particular segment and also allows user to tweak this saying that okay this price segment looks incorrect or the this discount percentage which is you know considered here is incorrect and needs to be you know fixed so user right. can fix there itself on the screen itself and then we'll save the data internally the tool will recalculate this and will show the new output if this is looks good then user can you know accept this as soon as the user accept this data will be automatically saved in the fair value table and table will be updated now the most important point here is even if you are tweaking this data this is for only a ssp calculation purpose or the fair value calculation purpose this is not going to impact your order management data actual okay 
and for future audit purpose all this information will be saved along with the timestamp with your user id whoever is making changes everything all this data will be saved in a separate table and which can be used for future reference purpose right. and because it's in a separate mm -hmm. table i can compare the old to the new and start Absolutely. looking at some of these trends right correct yeah. correct mm -hmm. so and, and and this process is pretty simple and this won't take uh, longer time certainly this saves a lot of time of business users yeah yeah and and you know we say words like oh you can pick 60 percent or 70 percent as a passing rate but it's a little more you you know most people will apply a little more science to that using you know Absolutely. because it's a, yes. a large enough population you'll apply standard statistics and say oh is it one two three standard deviations outside of the the, the median so that you can really get a sense of, you know, am I really getting the majority of transactions here? Um, because if you if you kind of arbitrarily pick it, I'm not sure the auditors really like arbitrary anything, right? Absolutely. So, so the benefit here of maintaining this the passing rate is like when we map the passing rate with the pricing segment, and if you have to go through this millions of line item data which we analyze and I have come across with some clients they have this price segment range goes up to 100 or 200 or 300 so business users need not have to go through each and every price segment and say oh this is pass or fail or whether the output is correct or not as soon as you achieve this the required passing percentage rate system will automatically pass this and save this in the table and will show you data only which is which failed to you know fulfill this passing percentage requirement. Let's say mm -hmm. my passing value is 60% and if I have achieved this as 55%, then suddenly only I will see only this data, not something which already accomplished this 60% mark, passing mark. Yeah. Great. And that saves a lot of time. Yeah. Absolutely. So with that, um, what everybody's been waiting for, um, the wonderful Sarah Thompson. Sarah, I'm going to see if I can pass uh, or you can take uh, control, I'll change the presenter to you. Are you there, Sarah? I am, John, can you hear me? I can, I think you are and good to go. let me know when you can see. I can see your beautiful Fiori screens. Awesome. All right, well, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration with the help of obviously my team, Prasad, Julio, John, um, just to kind of give you guys a lay of the land of what they have all been talking about. Before we get in and actually show you how you can create a sales order and how it actually works, what we're going to do is we wanted to show you what the team has done, the table that they have built, um, the background that they have been utilizing with the tool. So looks like it might be loading. Um, okay, so this is going to be the table that you're able to actually come in and see those standalone selling prices. So what Prasad was talking about, how about that inbound data and how it's um, bringing in the view of um, the invoices. So this is going to be our history data and it could be anywhere from the last six months to the last 12 24 months um, whatever data you want to utilize in order to gather that understanding around your standalone selling price so um, we were able to go out and capture let's just say over the last um, 12 months some of our, our invoices and those are actually brought in um, we've got our different pricing segments here that could be based off of customer um, group could be based off of material um, there's a lot of different rules in which we could break out how we're calculating the sale and selling price um, and then the fair value percentage that actually gets derived so we've got our median our average and the fair value percentage um, Prasad I will turn it over to you to be able to discuss a little bit more of how this this screen here in particular is going to help them derive their standalone selling price right so basically when when we pass this you know and the meet the passing percentage while analyzing the data and the data is approved okay or passed okay then it is this data is saved in this particular table for future reference purpose and each line item will be saved it is okay at the detail level and you can see on the extreme right hand side in case if somebody had changed the old discount percentage you, may, you are seeing here and you will see on the left hand side the new discount percentage basically in the discount percentage column so if some this we deliberately we 
made these changes so that we can demonstrate this capability and you can see here the who made the changes and when the changes are made okay and along with the timestamp this information is saved okay for auditor purpose so that whenever if any question comes from the auditor we can always show this and justify this you know also similarly we can always change the price segment also sometimes we have come across a, a typical requirement from the customers where they have one customer at a higher level in the hierarchy and order is placed against that customer but actual ship to parties and bill to parties are different here there could be multiple parties depending upon location to location and they want to you know calculate this based on the price segment so they have this their their own typical requirement so they can always tweak this based on this the information which is you know provided here so that's why this is this is pretty flexible and you can see all the details here right from your billing document number item number material or the sales order number item number complete information is there whether also it tells you whether this is pass or fail that line item and within whether we achieved this passing percentage or not so all this information is captured in this table yeah over to you sarah well real quick i think that's crucial here um in, in lots of different ways because of course now the data is here you can sort the data look at the data and i'm sure you guys will talk a little bit more about that um, and you have the timestamp. so from an audit perspective also you know, it just makes life so much easier um, to to understand and and when when ey pwc grant thornton whoever it is is auditing your books you can come back and say no look i have an audit trail how did i decide on ssp here you go and how many of my transactions it'll say, well, you arbitrarily picked that SSP. No, look, you know, 87.2% of my transactions actually fit within this space. So I think I have a valid number, right? Yeah, and John, I just wanted to, I wanted to add a very important point on this demo, because if you look on the screen here, you look at the discount, that's a very critical point because a lot of a lot of customers we talk to talk, talk, talk to us about well does your ssp tool incorporate discounting and the answer is absolutely yes because that's very critical and that is what it's doing on the right hand side there that's, that's a very important part of ssp including the discounting in any pricing transaction sure okay back to you sarah awesome thanks guys okay so once we have our pass fail um, and we are deriving our actual standalone selling price or fair value percentage um, there's another table that we have out there that actually shows the results so what comes of that fair value percentage um, we've got different types of um, contracts that you'll have with a customer, whether you're looking at a new or a renew of those material, you'll see the price segments coming in as well as the customer group. So these specific fair value percentages are derived based off of those pricing segments and customer groups. So different customer groups are gonna have different prices, different pricing segments, and then we'll see the material. So on this one, we're only focusing on three material that we have here, but you'll be able to see that these were just changed or are valid from um, yesterday. So we just made an update to the table um, and these are only valid from yesterday going forward until those changes are actually made. You'll see um, here we've got the median as well as the total percentage and our fair value that's actually calculated. Um, Prasad, do you wanna add a, yes, a comment on yes. here before we show yeah. the demo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So basically, if you see here, there's the one column says that uh, new and renew. Basically, this can be also another parameter here for the price segments where you can, you know, classify this as a new and renew because if there is a different standalone selling price, if you want to apply. So that's why we have included here also the based on the customer group materials here we have shown. Also, whenever you are, you'll be updating this, the table, okay. This is my valid from and valid to. Valid to date will be my today's date whenever I'm running next time. And my start date will be always tomorrow's date. Okay, so current date plus one. And my valid to date is always current. So that you will see, you know, all this standalone selling prices calculated over the period of time. We'll see in this table only. And RAR will pick up or revenue accounting tool. The application will pick up the correct 
fair value percentage and based on that the standalone selling price will be calculated and you will see updated on the performance obligation which sarah is going to demonstrate within the next couple of minutes over to you sarah Thanks, Prasad. Okay, so we're going to take this fair value percentage here and we're actually going to put it into a demonstration. So um, if we take a look here at our new category for our customer group O2, um, we've got a couple different pricing segments for different materials. We've got service and TGII. So within these two material, we're going to look for the fair value percentage that actually gets applied to our uh, performance obligations once we create a sales order. So for service, we're looking for 24, and for TG11, we're looking for 18.5. So what happens is when you come in and you create a sales order, um, again, the sales order could be created within SAP, it could be created externally if you've got third party systems that uh, integrate into RAR. What happens is once a sales order gets created, and I'll just come in here and show a sales order that I'm going to create a revenue accounting contract from. We've got our two services here. We are creating this um, sales order starting today. Uh, within our material, we do have our um, calculated contract price. So 10,000 for TG11 and 1.5 for service, bringing our total net value to 11,500. From there, the system is going to automatically take that fair value percentage and calculate that standalone selling price. So once we save our contract here, I didn't make any changes, so there's no data saved, we've got our, our sales order 3721. Now what happens is that standalone selling price is going to be derived based off the calculation uh, from the tool. So when I execute our contract 3721, when you come into your revenue accounting item monitor, you'll now have a new um, column here for fair value percentage. So we've got our 18.5 for our TG11 and 24 for our service. So as you can see, there's no errors. Everything looks good. It's going to create those performance obligations util utilizing that fair value percentage. And it does that if we come and look at our conditions. You'll see here it takes that 10,000 and now we have our calculated standalone selling price as well as our 1500 and our new standalone selling price. Those are not derived or brought in from uh, the sales order itself. They're actually derived here in the RIE monitor utilizing that statistical calculation. Prasad, any other additional comments? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So, so basically, this is this is uh, this uh, this is a real time calculation and application of standard and selling price here, and this process is works absolutely seamlessly, and you can see that the correct fair value percentage is picked up from the our standard and selling price SSP table, which is maintained in the system. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Awesome, thanks, Prasad. So, what we'll do is I'll just quickly process this. And then we can come and show the revenue accounting contracts that actually get created. We can see here now that we have processed our contract. We've got a revenue accounting contract for a local gap and IFRS. And then we'll be able to see those standalone selling prices come in automatically into our contract. All right, looks like it's taking a second. Well, I'm going to give it one more second, then I might pass it over to you, John. I know we've got uh, one minute, oh, it looks like we just hit eight o'clock, um, to wrap up. Yep. I'll let you start. Do you want to switch? Oh, here we go. Okay, 10,000, the 8 one, and mm -hmm. there's our sale and selling price. There you go. <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's see if I can take control back.
if I'm lucky. Show my screen. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Prasada. Hopefully everybody here got a really good sense of the fact that this is integrated um, and a lot more goes into this and we can talk more with you about it. Um, you know, we talked about, and we'll start wrapping up here, um, just keep in mind, and, and I'll walk through these, you know, keep in mind as we discussed this webinar and we discussed all of these things, there are a lot of other um, considerations that you need to take into effect. Um, you know, Julio implied, think about your channels. You know, is it a direct or indirect channel? How do you sell this? Because that's going to make a difference in how you uh, look at that. Are you principal versus agent? And then there are a lot of regional implications or laws. You know, um, Prasad talked about this idea of price segments or segmenting. You know, if you were to compare the United States, for example, to Japan, in the United States, um, it's very typical that you do a lot of discounting. You'll see a lot of high discount percentages, um, whereas in other countries such as Japan uh, and, and others in the Far East, discounting is, doesn't happen the same way. You, you, you don't do that. And so there are implications in those regions, and there are also laws around that, that structure as well. Um, another one to consider as you look at, you know, do I continue to do this in um, spreadsheets uh, or another tool is the complexity of your POB structures. Uh, we used a very simple one, and Sarah did a phenomenal job of showing you something that has two POBs. Um, you know, my friend Prasad here has dealt with companies, um, you know, such as several large companies out of um, uh, the San Jose area, uh, where their actual POB structures are in the thousands. Imagine allocating uh, standalone selling prices. Uh, across thousands of these POB structures and how do you keep tens of millions of records um, and look at this standalone selling price and of course you know that's something to keep in consideration on these volumes of data you know thinking about your pricing structures and finally you know does it make a difference you know I use a big term here and everybody will laugh you know what's the so what the big so what um, when you think about measuring these and looking at standalone selling price and the implications of the pricing segments, et cetera, really make sure that you've considered all of those issues as you look at that um, as well. So with that in mind, um, you know, we saw SSP, it's about data. SSP is the fulcrum of all of this activity. Uh, make sure that you have an application like this that helps ensure a proper audit trail. You want to periodically update. We've seen customers do annual versus biannual. Um, I think as we go through this process, you will begin to see uh, companies being uh, more aggressive uh, in that space and looking at maybe monthly updates or quarterly updates. Don't forget seasonality. Um, a lot of different companies have very different calendars, so make sure you're looking at your fiscal calendar or your seasonality. One of the reasons we recommend looking at a 12-month rolling uh, set of data is because it accounts for seasonality. If you are big at the end of the year um, for selling versus companies that have a big selling point in uh, the spring, you know, such as grills or outdoor activity, you know, certainly you want to keep that in mind. And of course, internal benefits of all of this are you can begin to share these results with management and begin to talk about pricing trends and analytics and insights as you look across your geographies, timeframes, pricing segments, business units, et cetera. Um, I just want to remind everybody, so if you really want to get an, a handle on this and understand how do I move from here, what's the next step, uh, give us a call. You know, we have a what we call a health check or a revenue assessment. We help look across four different dimensions of your revenue accounting ecosystem. We look at the accounting, the functional and system areas, technical and reporting. We do a series of 11 or so workshops with you. And we help you really begin to pinpoint things like standalone selling price, um, use of cost accounting, integration to project systems. Um, and we encourage you to reach out, check out our website. There's a lot of information uh, on our health checks. Um, there's a lot more information and look for some upcoming videos from Prasad, Sarah, and the rest of the team on standalone selling price, variable consideration, and others. And um, I want to thank all three of you uh, for just a fantastic um, webinar. Prasad and team, thank you. I think as the SSP tool continues to evolve, 
Um, I'm really impressed with the Fiori tiles and, and the way this is all presented. So thank you to everybody. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us. I want to wish you all a great day. Um, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, webinar uh, where we'll be focused on the topic of working capital, and that is uh, on March 30th at 10 a.m. Pacific. And of course, this one is being recorded and should be available early next week for you to download. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and in the words of my friend, uh, make it a great day. <laughs>